Welcome to Questions and Answers from Quarantine with Pastor Chris McMichael. Hello there. Welcome back to Questions and Answers from Quarantine. I'm Chris McMichael. I pastor here in Tennessee and Grafted Word Church is the name of our church family, our ministry here. We're on episode number 21. This is a pretty simple question. What is sanctification? I'm glad somebody asked because I can preach this any good, Holy Ghost, God-fearing, Bible-toting preacher ought to be able to preach at least one good sermon on sanctification. And so one of the things we want to say about it is that sanctification is the process whereby you are set apart to serve God. Sanctification is a process. We need to maybe distinguish some terms here. Um, I'm trying to think where I want to start off with. Let's go back to, we'll just go back to the Old Testament. When God began to make his covenant with Moses and Israel, he began to talk about sanctifying and setting apart and sanctifying and setting apart and, and call Levi, call Aaron and his sons and they will be sanctified and set apart. And you'll take this utensil and you'll cleanse it with the blood or you'll cleanse it with water and you'll sanctify it and set it apart. So what we see in that, pa that pattern over and over and over again is before anything under the law, Anything under the Mosaic, uh, Mosaic law could ever be used for God and used by God. It had to be cleansed, and once it was cleansed, it was set apart and devoted to God's use. So that helps us build the foundation and the premise and the principle of sanctification. So God would go on to talk about in the Levitical law, the, or the book of Leviticus, which has the Levitical law and talks about a lot of the rules and regulations for the priesthood. He talks about them being clean and holy and full of God's word, for they are set apart unto me. These all help build a principle for us in the New Testament that in order for us to maintain that kind of relationship with God or that kind of use, we also must maintain a sanctified or a set-apart life. Now, when we come over the New Testament, we come into a couple of new terms. We come into the term of righteousness, holiness, and sanctification, which weren't exactly parsed or dissected so much in the Old Testament. Under the Old Testament, you were made righteous or you obtained righteous or you attempted to obtain righteousness by keeping the law. And if you wanted to be used of God, then you set yourself apart with other sets of rules and laws, like the Nazarene vow. You've heard of uh, um, Samson was the famous Nazarite. I was not Nazarene, but Nazarite. Jesus was the Nazarene. Samson was a Nazarite. Two different words, no relation at all. If you were an Israelite under the law, and you wanted to set yourself apart especially and seek God in a new and better way than just what the law gave you, then you could invoke upon you, according to the book of Numbers, the Nazarite vow. And honestly, in many regards, what the Nazarite vow did for you kind of brought you up to speed with the Levites. And I don't have time to go into this, nor do I have it off the top of my head to give it to you, but I wrote a book about Samson and I had a whole chapter on this. Um, in the Under the Old Testament, you had the the laity, we would say, the Israelites, and they walked with God to this degree, but the Levites were set apart in a higher position. And as the Levites, they had a bunch of rules. You, you couldn't marry a divorced person. You couldn't be a midget. You couldn't have a hooked nose. You couldn't have damage to your private parts. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. You didn't touch wine or alcohol if you were going to be a Levite. And these allowed you to be sanctified, set apart, and used for God in a special capacity. Now, the Israelites, everybody else that was down here, if they ever wanted to do something special and come up higher, they could invoke upon them for a time being the Nazarite vow, which meant you didn't come close to anything, any human dead. You didn't touch any fruit of the vine, which really restricted your diet. And you never cut your hair for the length of the vow. And that allowed the Spirit of God and the presence of God to come upon you. And you did things that were on par with Levites, though you never stood in the office of a priest. We see that whole pattern and principle presented to us in the Old Testament to see that if God's going to use you, and if God's going to use me, we're going to have to be set apart and sanctified. And we see through the pattern of the Nazarite vow, 
the more you are set apart, the more different you'll look. The Nazarite's hair grew longer. And obviously, the longer the hair, the more you could recognize they had been set apart living a special consecrated life. So let's come to the New Testament. Now in the New Testament, we are not made righteous through the keeping of the law. We are made righteous through the blood of the Lamb and by our faith in His atoning work on the cross of Calvary. Now, if we're born again, we have been made, past tense, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what we are conditionally and in heavenly places is we are the righteousness of God. But that has nothing to do with how we're living right now, nor does it have anything to do with how we're being used of God. So that brings us to our second term, which is holiness. Holiness defines and describes how much you or I live according to the Bible. If we live according to the scriptures, if we live according to the 800 commands of the New Testament, 1,050 total, but a lot of them repeat, so you have 800 totally brand new, not brand new, but individual commands. A lot, about 250, 280 commands in the New Testament are actually from the Old Testament. So 30% of our New Testament commandments are actually law, straight up Mosaic law, but they're carried over through the cross. Holiness defines describes how we live effectively and in accordance with the New Testament commandments. The more you live according to the Bible, the holier your lifestyle. Honestly, you could be a pagan, you could be a total fornicating pig, a drunkard, a wino, and if you're born again, you are still the righteousness of God in Christ because it's not in you. The problem is if you're living like that, we call you backslidden, we call you a prodigal, we call you nigh unto death because the wages of sin is still death. You can be righteous and not be holy. But honestly, if you are the righteousness of God, there's going to be a constant conviction and misery on the inside of you until you become holy, living in accordance with the word and the law of God. Now that brings us to sanctification. Sanctification is all about being set apart. You can live according to the word of God and not be fully sanctified. You can live and be clean and be holy, but not give your life completely over to God. So let me give you a verse on, on uh, sanctification here. Um, probably the best one. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, just to show you that they, these are all different concepts. 1 Corinthians 1, verse... Um, oh, I've lost it here. Verse 30. See, he says, uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God is made unto us, Jesus Christ is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. We see that there is a difference between redemption. We have been redeemed. His redemption makes us the righteousness of God, and His righteousness allows us to walk in sanctification. So we see from that verse right there that they're all different concepts and principles. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is probably the best verse in the whole New Testament concerning sanctification. Verse 3, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain. And we'll pause there. So this is Paul, the apostle, writing to a spirit-filled New Testament church. They're born-again believers, but he's having to tell them, just because you're born again doesn't mean you're in the will of God. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're sanctified. The will of God for every believer is sanctification. What does sanctification look like in many instances? Abstinence. That you should abstain from, and in this case, fornication. Any Christian living in fornication, any Christian involved in petting, making out, necking, all this other stuff, anything above and beyond first base, <laughs> And I would really say, if you're not married, you don't need to be getting to first base. You need to be at home plate practicing your swing. Any Christian entertaining and participating in any of that is not a sanctified believer. And God's not going to use you because you're not sanctified. The more sanctified you are, the holier your lifestyle will become. Verse 4 says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and in honor. So now we see sanctification involves both your body and honor, which is your attitude. Know how to possess your vessel in sanctification. So it's not just how we behave with our thoughts, our mouth, our mind. It's also what we do with our body. 
not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Uh, long story short, if we're Christians, people ought to be able to tell the difference. If we're sanctified, set apart, Christians ought to be able to tell the difference. And truth be told, there is a hierarchy. There is a ranking in the kingdom of God. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you're holy. And just because you're born again doesn't mean you're sanctified. Just because you're born again doesn't mean God's using you. And just because you're sanctified doesn't mean you're as a set apart as someone who's been set apart for decades. Just because you got born again and you're, you're a little zealous and you got over one sin doesn't mean you got the victory over the other 20 sins in your life. This thing is a process that we never fully master. We're always just grabbing the next inch of territory and mastering it. And we're getting this under control and we're getting that appetite under control. And we're putting that, that habit down and we're picking up a new habit. Sanctification isn't just abstaining from things. It's embracing new things. It isn't just abstaining from sex and beer. It's embracing prayer and Bible study and evangelism. It's not just uh, drying up filthy language and cussing. It's also embracing a renewed mind and bringing into captivity every thought and every emotion. It's a process. It's, it's multifaceted. How about one more verse? Look at 1 Peter. This might encourage us. 1 Peter 1, 2. 1 Peter 1, 2. He says, we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. I want you to focus there on sanctification of the Spirit. Another verse says sanctification through the Spirit. This ought to encourage us. It means we have the Holy Spirit helping us to set ourselves apart. The Holy Spirit wants to produce these nine fruit in our life. And all nine of those fruit, as found in Galatians 5, and 23, they start to show us what sanctification looks like when it's been accomplished in our life. The fruit of the Spirit is love, so sanctification is going to produce love, not hatred. Joy, so sanctification is going to produce joy, not hatred anger or animosity or bitterness or grumpiness or mully grubs. Peace, the sanctification process of the Holy Spirit is going to produce peace, not fear, not agitation, not tense, wound tight, uptight, long-suffering. So the fruit of the Spirit, the process of sanctification is going to produce long-suffering, which we'd also call patience. So you're, you're not going to be impatient. You're going to be very patient. Gentleness, which means you're going to get the victory over being agitated and a striker and, and fierce and quick to want to throw a fight, throw a punch. Goodness, goodbye being a jerk. Faithfulness, no longer serving you. Meekness, no longer prideful. Meekness is the opposite of pride. And self-control. Sanctification, in its purest form, looks like these nine fruit working in every area of your life. And the more you have these fruit working in your life, the more God Almighty will use you. And God will use you the day you get born again. But three months later, he's going to require more of you to be used in the same manner. And if you're barely keeping up with how God is expecting things of you, then he's going to only be able to use you in the same capacity he has always used you. If you want God to use you more, you've got to become even more sanctified, even more set apart, even more endowed with holiness, even more full of the word of God. The bigger the fruit of the spirit in your life, the more God will promote you and use you. Take inventory of these nine fruit. Any one of these that looks like a raisin in your life, that's an area to, to work on. We want God to use us. Sanctification is the process whereby we get the nature of Christ manifested from the inside to the outside to where his fruit is evident and everybody around us can see it and God promotes that fruitful vineyard. Amen. I think that'll do. Kind of a shorter one, but I've been recording a lot of 20-minute answers here lately. Hope that helps you. Be sanctified. Be holy. Keep praying against this coronavirus. We curse it in the name of Jesus. We command sanity, normalcy, and wisdom to come back to our nation. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time.